Well, good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Grateful for all our brothers and sisters who could be here. Any visitors, we are appreciative of having you here as we start our new year. As we were in the back with the worship team, Heather brought up, she was reading from Solid Joys and uh, just uh, Pastor Piper was just sharing at the end of every year, he likes to look and examine as if it was his judgment day, you know, that my life has been sealed and looking at this last year, uh, the faithfulness uh, of how I lived and who I shared with and people I wanted to talk with and all the different ways to look and see, you know, Bible reading and all of that. And, and then, uh, thank God, we get another year to, to go change and grow and keep walking. And so uh, a new year is an excellent time as a body to slow down and examine our lives. And, and what I like is I'm just hearing from every one of you. I just want to know more of Christ this year, and you want to pursue Him, and that, that does an old pastor's heart good to hear that from all the bodies. So we love you guys greatly. Let me read our text. Uh, that's the foundation for what I want to share with you this morning. It's in Matthew 16, verse 13. When Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He began asking His disciples, saying, "'Who do people say that the Son of Man is?' And they said, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, but still other Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to him, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overpower it. And so the foundation stone of the church will be Jesus Christ, that he is the, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. And the church will be built on that, and everything will find its direction and purpose with Christ as our foundation. And so this morning we'll look at the church I want to look at God's plan and program for his kingdom, that is to take this gospel to the nations. And it's not going to be in a physical temple any longer. We don't go to Jerusalem, but it's a spiritual temple that he's building, and we are living stones in that temple when we come to faith in Christ. Peter tells us in 1 Peter 2, coming to Christ is to a living stone rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And so the church is these mission centers that are sent all over to reach the world, the nations. And the, the insiders, those who have been redeemed by this grace of Jesus Christ, are to grow and they're to mature into Christ-likeness. And as we go out then and reach the nations, we're to bring them into the church to grow them up into Christ likeness. And as I was driving in this morning, I was just worshiping how I love God's plan and program and the, the body of Christ. What, what a beautiful thing that God has designed. And that is what I would like to speak with you on this morning. I read a book last month called Rediscover Church by Colin Hansen and Jonathan Lehman. And I'm going to try to seek this morning to summarize for you the beautiful truths that they share in that book. I want to give them credit as I was reading it. I thought, this is what I want for Southside Bible Church in 2022. And so we're going to examine a, a biblical definition of what is the church. And as we go into a new year, our understanding of it and our commitment to the bride of Christ. So let's go before him and, and pray. Father, we do come before you because the veil has been torn in two. Jesus Christ's work has caused us to be able to come into your presence now, blameless and full of joy and stand in it. And so we thank you for such a gospel. And I thank you, Lord, that your design of how you will take such a beautiful gospel in Jesus Christ to the world will come through these uh, local assemblies called the ecclesia, the church. And so, Lord, I pray that you will now meet each one of us to understand from your word, your, your plan for the, the bride of Christ, the church, 
and that we would understand it, it, is, it is infinite wisdom, it is brilliant, it is beautiful, and it is the need of every soul. And so I pray that, that we would see uh, the importance of why we need it and just move in our midst, Lord, and use it for the advancement of your name's sake, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it, it's reported that about a third of churchgoers have stopped going to church since COVID hit. When the churches opened back up, about a third of Americans that were attending church did not come back. What is being reported is that many of them realized when the quarantines were enacted and they, they started watching church on live stream for a season, that it made them ask, why do I go to church or do I even need it? Is there really a, a need to give priority to my life to the local church? And so the question is, why go to church? It's filling our land right now. And for many, the reasons for attending church before COVID were not sufficient after COVID to continue attending a local assembly. And I think some of that is while locked away, there was so much division over COVID and masks and government and social meltdowns and rioting, Facebook conspiracies and ranting on it. I think Christians liked each other a lot more before social media. <laughs> Take away weekly worship and, and love can grow cold for one another. And what I saw was our deep allegiance to our political views became so entrenched that some had more in common with their political allies who are not even Christians than the local church. COVID decisions that were made by leadership and churches uh, brought about a lot of suspicion and questioning. Some, you, you didn't stand up to the government, and others, you didn't submit to the government. I wonder if I can sit in the same church with people who didn't even vote for Trump. Even though we have one Lord and one faith and one baptism and one hope in common, those other things broke the unity of the Spirit in many churches. And so for a third of the visible church, when I say visible, it's those who attend church. The invisible church are those who've been born again and are true believers. They have many reasons not to come back to church. And for many others, they came back with a lack of trust in leadership and a lack of trust in members. Uh, and some came back even for wrong reasons. And it's caused myself and many others to sit back and ask then, why should we come back to church? What is the purpose of church? We, have we gotten it wrong all of these years? And so some big questions need to be asked and answered. And your pastor, who's not afraid to step on toes if it makes you more like Christ, is going to address that this morning. So let's, let's pray again uh, for what I'm going to talk about. No, I, I already feel prayed up. The quote that these authors use at the start of this book and, and at the end of the book I think is fitting, and I want to quote them on it. It says that God calls us into the church we really, rarely want, yet he calls us into the one that we need. I will try to explain that as we go this morning. Jesus shed his blood to purchase her. I, I just think if you don't have a high view of the church, you, you miss that it was bought with royal blood. Divine blood spilt out for her. We're one body. We're to join hands and hearts to fulfill the commission that Jesus left for this bride. We have an amazing unity. If one suffers, we all suffer. And if one rejoices, we all rejoice. It's just as if I was suffering. When you're suffering, it's as if I'm going through it. And when you're blessed, it's as if I'm being blessed. In the church, Christ is present in a very unique way. He says his lampstand is present when, they get, when we gather. Heaven touches down on earth. He's now working to perfect his bride from every spot and blemish. And one day we're going to be the church triumphant, made perfect and spotless and blameless, and given to the Son of God for their eternal marriage forever. So let's start with the, the big question this morning. What is church? And for many, it's a building. Um, for some of you, I, I hate to say this, but it's a place that my parents make me go. Some of you guys are already looking bored and going to sleep. And then, and then so are the kids. <laughs> 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 so 
some it's a place to go see my friends, but I want to ask yourself right now as you sit in your seat, what is church to you? And the church is where God's spirit indwells believers, and so it, therefore it does make us one. And it's a place where God is to be worshiped. And his word is proclaimed in an organic body that with all of our gifts, we cause the growth of the body as we intermingle and interact. So it's not a club, it's not a building, it's not a performance, it's not pep talks. It is living as a stone in a holy temple that God is building where he dwells. Unbelievers need a gospel community to see it worked out, to watch the life of the church, to see that God really does change and transform people. And so heaven touches down on planet earth throughout the gathered churches. And right now, everyone's looking for peaceful society, and they're looking for government to bring it about and the social issues of our day. And the place what they're really looking for is a king who's building a kingdom with one person at a time called the local church made up over the whole world. So what is church? We're told it's the family and household of God. The Bible tells us it's the body of Christ, it's the temple of the spirit, it's the pillar and foundation of the truth, it's the bride of Christ, it's Christ's flock and many more analogies for such a beautiful institution. And so what I want to do this morning is I want to give you these authors' definition, and then each chapter they flush it out, and that's what I would like to do this morning. So if you could put up there uh, the definition uh, that we will flush out for the church. It's one of the best definitions I've come across, all-encompassing of what the church is. <clears throat> and so we will try to understand it before we walk out this morning. A church is a group of Christians who assembles as an earthly embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom to proclaim the good news and commands of Christ the King to affirm one another as his citizens through the ordinances and to display God's own holiness and love through a unified and diverse people in all the world following the teaching and examples of the elders. So let's begin with our first part. A church is a group of Christians, if you'll put up that first point. So what I want you to see as we begin the beauty of this gathering is that it's a gathering of those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ, a gathering of those who have been baptized. You've come into these waters and you've testified that I have faith in Christ. I publicly want to proclaim that I, I own him, I want to follow him, and I want to obey him the rest of my life. You've been born again, and you've been identified with Christ through baptism. My old man died. What I was in Adam was buried. What's, what's raised is a new creation to walk in newness of life. I've been converted. I've been born from above. To, to be a part of a family, you've got to be born into it or adopted into it, and we're both. We're born from our parents with the sin of Adam, original sin, and we're born again with the life of Christ and his spirit now freed from the guilt and power of sin and one day even the penalty or the presence of sin. And that truly is why many did not come back to church. That, they've never experienced that. And it's why you were knocking down the doors and singing and hugging and rejoicing when we finally could gather back together. I couldn't keep you out. I'm trying to keep the doors closed and you get the Troyers who won't leave you alone and they keep <laughs> popping in and saying, I want to worship with God's people, my forever family. And you were adopted into it. Galatians 4, when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law in order that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons to, to, to live what the law required and take the consequences for all the transgressions of the law so we could be adopted as children of God into the family of God. This is where you fit. I don't fit in the world anymore. I don't think like it. I don't love what it wants. I come here and I'm home. This is my family with those who love Christ and want to obey him with all of their being. What a blessing the body of Christ is. This is where I fit. So what we do here at Southside, as members, we, we hear your, your testimony that you've been born again and you've come to faith in Christ and that you've publicly declared it in the waters of baptism. 
Secondly, we're a group of Christians who assembles. I want to look, look at that. Who assembles? So my question is, do we really need to assemble? That's what the church is. God's called out ones who, who gather and assemble. There's power in gatherings. And it surrounds you right now, the power of God. And that doesn't happen live streaming. It, it affects body and soul when we come together. We're, we're one. We're one in what we believe and hope in and look for. And there's power in that. Gatherings are powerful within this building and without. Gathering of the church changes lives, it changes cultures, and it changes the world. The church gathering is the city of God. Our gathering tells the world we're citizens of heaven, and we gather with this blessed hope, and it's what unifies us and brings us together. It's beautiful. And I'll tell you this, after COVID, when we assembled, we saw afresh how spiritual the gathering is uh, when the church comes together. We're physically gathered with Christ, the lampstand. So the church is not a place, it's a people gathered with Christ. The church is a people assembled in a place we must gather. That is Jesus' design for his bride. Regularly gathering together, seeing one another, (coughs) learning from one another, worshiping with one another, encouraging one another, correcting one another, loving one another, praying for one another. We gather. We hear the word together. We do it together. Christianity is more than an information transfer. We're not a virtual church. It's an oxymoron. The writer of Hebrews said this, let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds in the gathering, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some. It's just going to become a habit. It's just, you don't need the church. You're not going to gather. It's just will become a habit. But instead, gather and encourage one another. And all the more, as you see the day drawing near and the days we're living in, what we're watching, we need it all the more. For if we go on sinning willfully and after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And I've said it many times, gather together. And he says, don't fall away into sin where you destroy yourself in verse 26. And the protection from destroying yourself in sin is this gathering to help each other. So it's a gathering. It's a people who assemble. (coughs) Thirdly, Number three, a church is a group of Christians who assembles as an earthly embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom. What is an embassy? An embassy is an officially sanctioned outpost of one nation inside the borders of another nation, and it represents and speaks for that foreign nation. And so the church is an embassy of heaven. We we step in and we find a whole different nation in here. You guys make no sense. I love it. You're you're aliens, sojourners, weird, different, called out believers. We are a different nation. Exiles, citizens of Christ's kingdom. Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. We live different. We're not about the externals. We, we know Christ and, and we, we trust and we pray. We, we, we uh, look for our uh, daily provision from him. And the whole Sermon on the Mount shows you citizens who live for another world and you don't fit this world. You gather to hear the king's words. You want to hear heaven's language of faith and hope and love. You want to spread the message to the nations. And you want to taste heaven's culture by its citizens. I I love it. (laughs) May we declare and embody heaven well, Southside. That's our call. That that is what the church is. That's why we came running back. And so this is our our place. It's, It's heaven. It's our embassy. It's where we see God and his people and what he's about. And so there's just nothing sweeter than the the gathering with these like-minded, like-hearted brothers and sisters. So we are an embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom. We're this outpost of glory here in this earth. Fourth, 
We are to proclaim the good news and the commands of Christ, the King. We're to proclaim the good news and commands of our, of our King. So the preaching and teaching of God's Word is central to our gathering. The elders in this church stand and claim to speak on behalf of God as we speak from this Word. And so we, we believe in exegesis where you study it to try to get in its original context and proclaim it for what its original intent was. That's what we live on. That's what we depend on. Uh, I've said it before, we, we can't outdo Steven Spielberg, so we're not even trying. We're just going to declare this word day in and day out. Uh, even if it's not exciting, new, it's the word of God, and we're just going to look at it and hear from our king every time we gather. We're going to preach the word in season and out of season. We don't try to be clever, our own thoughts, manipulate, use persuasive words. It's God's word day in and day out. Give me the old paths. We gather to hear from God together. And as we gather, we need divine thoughts. We don't need human thoughts. We need our king's thoughts for life and godliness and how we live. We need to hear from our homeland, not human wisdom. And on Sundays, the Lord's Day, we gather to hear together from our king. And we are shaped together by his word. And that's why we center our gatherings here around his word, because it makes us a heavenly colony. I've, I've said this before as well, two things that are going to last forever, God's word and God's people. So we seek to put God's word in his people. And these men, their definition of preaching is it's shaping a colony of heaven together. The sermon casts a vision from God's word for a particular people in a particular place, as they have covenanted together to obey and love one another. I, I want to obey this word with you, and I want to love you as we journey the fulfillment of the whole law. Amen? Number five. Let me read the whole thing. The church is a, a group of Christians who assembles as an earthly embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom to proclaim the good news and the commands of Christ the King and, and to affirm one another as his citizens through ordinances. And so is joining a church necessary? Well, what the church does, it recognizes my citizenship. And I want you to catch this. It doesn't uh, make me a citizen. I, I can't save anyone. We, we, we don't hand out passports here at Southside Bible Church. We baptize believers and we share the Lord's Supper together where we join shoulder to shoulder and we remember what Christ did for us and our faith and our hope. And we're going to do that at the close of this service. We live as citizens of another world. So the Lord's Supper is a family meal. It's not an individual one. It's a family meal where we, we remember together our faith and our hope. So membership is how we formally recognize and commit to one another as believers. God's design and beauty in the local church. And, and, and I've had this argument, I belong to the universal church, so I don't need to belong to a local church. And you miss the whole design of this beautiful bride. You join. You give yourself to its members and to oversight of its leadership. Church membership, uh, uh, the words are not in the Bible, but it's on every page. What I, Matthew 18, 17, and Matthew 18, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. 1 Corinthians 5, 2, and you have become arrogant and have not mourned instead in order that the one who has done this deed might be removed from your midst, the church. Acts 2, 41, so then those who had received the word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls to the church. Acts 6, 2, the 12 summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word in order to serve tables. And so we got to have deacons and we serve uh, in the church. So Acts 12, 5, Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being made fervently by the church. Galatians 1, 2, all the brethren who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Uh, appoint elders, he said to Titus, in every church. 
And so we see that the, the church is the whole design of the new covenant, and it's where we work out God's salvation that He's working in us. And so this is membership in a family, in a body being connected to every other part. And so a, a local body, it's not a status, it's a job where we come to labor and work for the king. And you're expected to show up for work. Membership's not a passive thing. You jump in and you serve one another. It can't be 90 minutes a week or you've missed the whole calling of the church. We get in and we serve one another and help each other on our way to our true home. It cannot be passive. And so therefore the church, number six, is to display God's own holiness and love. We're, we're, to, we're to show what, what the homeland looks like, who our God is. We're to, we're to live lives that, oh, that's what the king is like. We show that, that whom God loves, he, he disciplines so that we might share in his holiness in Hebrews chapter 12. And so here's a, a very important thing then is we are to, to be holy together and help each other be holy. And so the body of Christ must help each other and point out sin that's going to endanger us and hurt us on our journey and putting Christ on display in all of his fullness. This is a, a community that's pushing each other to live for Jesus Christ and to be holy, to help each other where we're missing it. So it, it's such a beautiful assembly because we want that together and we're all in. <laughs> Therefore, Jesus, something that is not popular in our day and age, but Jesus Christ himself, the king of love, gives this command in Matthew 18. He says to the church, if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed so that truth is being established. You're not just being manipulated or hogwashed. It, it's, Jesus has such a beautiful design. And if he doesn't listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax gatherer. That is why people run from the church in many cases. I don't want people pointing out my sin. That's my business. And I want you to see this morning, this is the beauty and the amazing means of grace in this body is that we help each other to live holy. And when we drift, we, we call each other to repentance because we're sinner saints on our way to glory. Raise your hand if you're a sinner. Just don't. If you didn't put your hand up, go home. <clears throat> I need someone to confront me when I drift in sin. It's the bottom line. I have to have that. I need it pointed out lest I be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It is a deceitful thing. And it will harden your heart quicker than anything. Have you, cement. Man, cement hardens so fast. The heart's way quicker than cement. And it will harden so quickly. And it'll be harder than cement. And some of you, this is the most terrifying thing in the world to think of, is to let people speak into my life. You can only think about maybe abuse or things that happen in growing up. But the way God's assembly does it is in love. We care about each other and we help each other to lead me to repentance and willful not turning from sin. There's a danger. And so the church is to discipline me in this sin. Discipline is the church saying in that last step, we're no longer willing to affirm your profession of faith, which was baptism and communion and membership. And so the facts are established and the witnesses that you're not walking in God's ways. So discipline, it's not punishment or retribution. It's love to lead each other to repentance. And you need to not fear it, but thank God for this protection from your own sinful heart. And churches have quit practicing it. And the beauty is that a true church practices this to help each other on our way to glory. So the practical invitation, application, uh, my buddy Ray back there, just every time we ever would go on a trip or anything, on the way back, he would just say, you've been with me for three, four days. What do you see in my life that I could grow in? What sin do you see? He's, he's begging for it. So I would just pull out the list and go through it. <laughs> 
I, in all truthfulness, every time I was like, nothing. He's the, he's the godliest man I've ever known. Crazy guy. <clears throat> so invite it. Treasure it. Love it. I'm more afraid of my own heart than not someone not telling me what they're seeing in it. And, and this is the beauty of a body of Christ. When you stay outside of it, I've watched this. Your sin grows up, and there's no one to come and confront it and share it. By, by getting in a body, you start seeing their warts, your warts. So many things come out you know, by community. And, and there's a beauty in it, and that's how we help each other grow. And those who don't engage it, I, I've seen them walk in the same sins for 30, 40 years. It, it, please. God's design is so perfect. Number seven. It says we do it then. The, a church is a group of Christians who assembles as an earthly embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom to proclaim the good news and the commands of Christ the King to affirm one another as his citizens through the ordinances, baptism and communion, and to display God's own holiness and love through a unified and diverse people in all the world. <clears throat> and this is so big. How do I love people who are different? Isn't this what our world's trying to figure out? How are they doing? It's not going well. And we come into the colony of heaven and we're going to love, we're, we, we're going to do what the world's trying to find. We can love people who are different than me. Cultures, skin, all kinds of things. This is what our world can't figure out, and they make laws and regulations that can't change a heart. And God comes and changes a heart, and he makes you love everyone in a whole new way. Jesus says in Matthew 5, you heard you know, love your friends, but I, I say even love your enemies. And so there's something new in this kingdom that we've been brought into. We, we have love even for our enemies. We, we can, if there's someone you can't love, you, you, you don't get the gospel. It breaks down every barrier. And this, I love this, this, this assembly, this colony of heaven is that we have a love for all cultures, all peoples. The church is a deep, God-given love between a unified, diverse people. It's not right politics. It's not a bunch of good people. It's not for people who look and think and act just like I do, which is what the church is doing in many areas. It's trying to unify around those things. I, I like what one man said. He said, if the Holy Spirit left your assembly one day, I pray you would all hate each other. Because the only thing that, that unifies us is, is the Holy Spirit and the gospel. And we, we're just all walks of life, all different people. And the only thing that would unify us is Jesus Christ. Take that away, you probably wouldn't even like each other. It's a gathering of sinners who have been saved by grace. So we're gracious. It's the sick who need a doctor, not the healthy. The gospel transcends all earthly divisions. To walk into a group of believers and say, I don't fit, you've missed it. Can't be. It just cannot be. We have everything in common. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. I love being with my brothers and sisters in Christ. If, if you can't get past it, you're not understanding the gospel. <clears throat> it isn't like the world where you have to agree on all the same things. I, I like uh, throwing cornhole. I, I like beer. I like, and you find everybody that what you like and gather, and it's like that is the opposite of this beautiful kingdom come together with all these differences and variances, and we're unified because of Jesus Christ. The gospel transcends earthly divisions. We're not blacks and whites and rich and poor and Jews and Gentiles and Republicans and Democrats. We're one in Christ. That's what makes this so beautiful. The church is not trying to get unity by uniformity and even by diversity. People are not looking for churches where we all think the same on politics, the same thoughts on COVID, the same thoughts on social issues, how you outreach ages of cultures. The church is where we differ, and we are united on the essential things of God. The church brings together people who normally would not associate, tax gatherers and harlots, the slave and the free and the poor and the wealthy. 
It's a unified diversity in the body of Christ, as we read this morning. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, entreat you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called. There is a way to live worthy of this gospel. It's to come into this place with humility and gentleness and patience and forbearance to one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. The whole gospel's at stake in our unity. There's one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. That's what unifies us. And if anything else does, it's a false unity. That's our bond as we gather here on Sundays. And I want you to hear this. No pandemic or election or anything created can break our unity. In COVID, we drew closer together in love and trust than we ever have. Maintain the unity of the Spirit became one of the sweetest commands in my heart. There is no other gathering like the church of God. The body of Christ is a fellowship of difference. We're not alike, and yet we need each other, and we're all gifted differently. We're interdependent, but we have the same faith in Christ, but a diversity of experiences. And this is not the fastest way to grow a church, but it's a durable and a healthy one when it's built this way. And politics and a pandemic have broken and shattered many churches. But I think it's better to hunker down with all of our differences and then find where we all think, trying to all think the same on politics and COVID because in that stress and strain to love because of what we truly have in common as a true embassy. And we're going to stand out in this world, and it's what the world's looking for right now. They're looking for a place like this. They're looking for a place where everybody knows their name and they're always glad you came. Number eight, we're to do it in all the world. And so now I'm back to that question, what is the church for? Why do we do what we do? Is it outside our walls or is it inside our walls? There's so much debate. And I want to, the, the authors go over four popular answers and I want to go over them this morning. And the first is that the church exists only for evangelism. And so our whole focus is to, to get people from outside inside, to get people inside the building so they can hear the gospel and be saved. The teaching stays focused on the basics uh, what will interest unbelievers? How do I get them to come and listen? And we preach on subjects that connect with everyday life, and, and it's called seeker-sensitive. And so we just got to get the world to come in and make our services where it fits for them. <clears throat> the other thought is, no, the church exists for good works. The church exists to mobilize our people to go outside the walls and then go do good works, open soup kitchens and shelters and ESL and, and teach our church how to do good works. That, that's the calling of the church. Get out there. Go change your society. The third is it's a place of healing. So much pain and hurt and afflictions in our world. Life gets better when you come inside our walls. These, the teaching focuses on miracles and the power of the Spirit to heal people of addictions and relational issues and health issues, and, and your whole focus is you've you got prayer rooms to heal people. The fourth is dispensing grace, where the church dispenses forgiveness. The church's role is a mediator between God and humans and communion that is uh, communicated to them. And so those are four of the most common issues they're assessing in our country. And so my question is, what should it be? Because I get people, the four I just said, every one of you probably say, yeah, 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 yeah. And everyone's got a thought of this is what the church should be. And that can bring disunity. And all of those have elements. There's always someone leaving a church because they come short of what they feel it should be in that area. So my question is, how do we function with that difference? And thank you, Jesus, before he left this earth, he stood and he gave his, our marching orders. Jesus came up and he spoke to the disciples saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so Jesus' parting message to the church <coughs> is you're to do it now and even to the end of the age. So we, we know we're in the right place because he's saying from, from that time till he returns, this is what you're to do. So we're, we're in the right spot. So this is to the insiders of the church, the believers, the apostles. And this is the command of what they're to go do for outsiders. They're to make disciples of all the nations. And so how do insiders turn outsiders into disciples? And disciples are those who follow Jesus. They believe him, they, they follow, they obey him. They, they're, they're followers of Christ. And how do we do it? Go, get out there, go. Proclaim the gospel, share it with all that God brings your way. Make it your effort, your time. <coughs> Baptize them. Bring them into the church where they believe in Jesus Christ. They put faith in him. They get saved. And now they're brought in. And then they must learn to observe Jesus' teaching. Teach them all things. Three years of being with those apostles and teaching and training and modeling. It takes time. It takes uh, patience. It takes in-person. It takes relationship. It takes dialogue. It takes preaching. It takes teaching. All of these things to teach people how to be followers of Jesus Christ in their lives. The answer, the church today, we're to go and turn outsiders into insiders by the gospel message. We are, we're to go, having gone. Conversion, we get to preach the best message there's ever been. The church teaches and shows then how to be disciples of Jesus in relationships and depth and endurance. It cannot be a classroom setting only. Healing, prayer and grace, as I mentioned, what people are looking for in a church, they're all good, but they're not ultimate. In John 14, Jesus said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I said to you. The Holy Spirit will be working to, to show us what Jesus taught and how to follow him. And so we have the Spirit of God to make us followers of Christ. And so I want you to get this. Our mission is to share what Jesus has done, and to bring people in and baptize them, and to teach them how to walk in his footsteps and loving good deeds, loving our community, doing justice, all these things, these good works into a community will flow from that. And so when a church obeys the commands together, we're a city set on a hill and we're going to shine into the darkness. And we'll be a colony of heaven and outsiders will come in and they'll see what the kingdom of God truly is. And so we must get our house in order for outsiders to see the light and to come into this and marvel and say, what, what is this? What is this colony of heaven? And so our commission is clear. The gospel, conversion, bring them inside and teach them all things how to be disciples and how to fulfill the, the command, the, the great command to love God and love others. How to shine in a dark world. That's why we come to church. We need to teach each other this and we need to learn and where we're going to be moving this year at our elders' retreat is we talked about our 2022 focus is this discipleship, this personal training and teaching how to walk as Jesus walked. I just, someone might just say, I just need someone to sit down and teach me how to pray. I just want to know how to love my wife. And there's just all these practical things that we're going to try to build a trellis so that the vine can just grow. You can't, you can't legislate this. You, you can't make it. But a, a trellis is, is just to, to have some foundation of going to these next levels in day-to-day -day relationships and discipleship. So I want all of you praying and thinking through. I want to pour into others, and I want others to pour into me. And I, I hear this great debate with the women. Uh, do, do the older women ask me to be discipled, or do the younger women ask the older women to be discipled? And it's a simple answer, yes. Okay, Guys, simple answer, yes. And we start... 
realizing I, I need to be plugging in and learning these things. So I, I learn the Word of God. I go to Bible studies, but I'm going deeper into day-to-day. And so there's a lot of things that we will be structuring and moving forward this year. But I, I need your mindset to realize that I have to keep growing how to follow Jesus in my everyday life. And I pray that you're burning in your heart to want to do that. And we've got so many who have grown and know how to do that, ready to pour in and help you be followers of Christ. That's the the high calling, make disciples. That's why we come to church. And number nine, following the teaching and examples of elders. And so we look for for elders who uh, understand doctrine and can teach it. But their example is, is that teaching getting into my heart and my life. Am I a follower of Jesus? And we don't want to give you elders who just have head knowledge or, or just say, I just want to live a certain way. It's, it's both that have purity of doctrine and protect it and guard it. But that truth is making you a follower of Jesus and humility and love. And so those are the, the, the safety nets of having a leadership who, who are tender and truthful and kind and loving and forbearing as we journey this together to become followers of Christ, not control freaks. So that's going to be a very important piece uh, that I feel we're we're blessed with. I I could be shepherded by every one of our elders. I love their walks with God, and that's where we begin, is interviewing the wives. How does he love you? What's it like in home? And we want to know all of those things. So a church is a group of Christians who assembles as an earthly embassy of Christ's heavenly kingdom to proclaim the good news and commands of Christ the King to affirm one another as his citizens through the ordinances and to display God's own holiness and love through a unified and diverse people and all the world following the teaching examples of the elders. And so my conclusion, as these men said, No one gets the church they want until glory, but everyone gets the church they need. And in all of our weaknesses and warts and brokenness, that's how God's going to grow us and teach us to become followers of Jesus Christ. And so my personal testimony in closing is it was 15 years into the church that I, I I thought church was just a place you came and you preached and everybody went home and lived it. It didn't work. And I started learning in Ephesians 4 that preaching is to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And so they they go and that the body is interdependent on each other and all of our gifts. We we lock shields, we get in and and we start to, to speak into each other's lives and encourage and pray and exhort and admonish. And all of these things are what grow us up into the head. And so what again, what I've seen in my journey is those who have never locked into a body with all of its warts and all of its blessings. And they just pop around and flit to this church, to that church. They don't grow the way they should. And I've got 30 years of watching this. And what I've watched is those who have locked in and worked through hardships, frustrations, and difficulties, they've just blossomed like these vines on a branch. And there's so many in here who I've known you 30 years and I've watched what has happened by giving yourself to the body of Christ. So instead of finding the perfect church, which is called heaven, what is it? The the one, no one gets the church they want, but everyone gets the church they need. Engage it and let God use our graces and our warts and everything to grow us up and to build us up into a head, the Lord Jesus Christ. I can't tell you enough how much I love the bride of Christ. Jesus shed his blood for her with a beautiful design. Give yourself to it. Okay? Our country says don't. Be your own person. Hide. Stay back. It's not safe. And God's designed it where you got to get in with both feet and give yourself to this body and, and spend and be spent for each other's souls and for the spread of making disciples. And I rejoice that we're about to, to plant a church in Tijuana to make disciples there. I was listening to Paul Washer, and, he, and after his whole life, he said, if I could do one thing in my life, I would plant a church, just one church. And, and that's going to be this, this mission center to spread and advance the kingdom. 
And so in Tijuana, man, my joy is God loves Tijuana because he sent these beautiful missionary souls that love Christ and are going to begin to spread that message. Gets me excited. All right, that's for free. All right, let me pray. Father, I thank you for such a beautiful design of how you will spread and advance your kingdom. And I thank you that it's always in a different way than the world would do. It's in humility. It's in simplicity. It's in broken sinners who come to Jesus, being united and made one, and loving each other now with all of our differences and helping each other become followers of Jesus Christ. All I want for everyone in this room is to follow Christ. God, help us to lay our lives down to help each other become more like our blessed Savior so that he would be put on display and the world would come in and see and say, what is this? What a colony of heaven I want in. I want to be a part of this community. I want Jesus Christ. He's a Savior. He changes lives. He he makes those who were once prejudiced lovers of all souls, lovers of Christ, lovers of his kingdom, lovers of this world. Thank you, God, for such a plan. And I pray, 2022, Lord, that we would see the beauty of your design and we would give ourselves to the local assembly, the bride of Christ, and Lord, use it to deepen our love for you and our love for others. And it's in the beautiful name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen.